ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Rochelle Diamond. Welcome, everyone. We are going to start today right away with some audience participation. If you're excited to be here today, put your hand up in the air. All right. <laughs> this goes for you on the stream, too, if you're paying attention. Um, and for those of you who like to be inspired, if you like to be inspired, I want you to stand up. All right. Yeah, do the wave. No, no. <laughs> and if you're excited to start now, see what I did there? And learn how to make a difference in people's lives and inspire other people, I want you to put both hands up in the air. All right. Power pose. Feels good, right? All right. And for all of you for being here today to invest in yourselves, to learn how to make a difference, I want to you to take those hands and I want you to put them together and give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> all right, thank you. Thank you so much. You guys can take your seats. Thanks so much for playing along. I'm Rochelle Diamond. I'm on our Play Experience team here at LinkedIn and I run our speaker series and I'm so happy to welcome all of you here in the room and on the stream. Our speaker series is all about bringing in inspiring ideas and diverse, innovative thinkers that offer different perspectives to help our members and our employees be more productive and successful. We've had so many amazing speakers in the past. You can always check those out at speakers.linkedin.com. And you can also download it as a podcast on our iTunes channel there. So as you all know, we have a very special guest today. You may know her from her days as a first daughter in the White House. You may know her from the amazing work she's done with the Clinton Foundation all around the world around topics like early childhood education, girls and women's rights, global health care, just to name a few. Or you may know her as a best-selling author. Start Now is her fifth book, and it was written to educate and inspire children on how to make a difference in the world. And I have to tell you, I read it, and I really learned a lot, so I think everyone can get something out of this book. Now, I want to tell a story about Chelsea. She actually learned to use her voice and make a difference at a very young age. When she was five, she wrote a letter to President Ronald Reagan. And she wrote to him because she had learned of an event he was about to attend at a cemetery where Nazis were buried. And since she had just watched Sound of Music, she had learned that these people were not nice people and he, she didn't think it was a good idea. So she wrote him a letter. Unfortunately, she never heard back from him. And I learned just today that she actually even included a sheet of rainbow and heart stickers. And so she was very <laughs> upset not to hear back. But what happened after that, I think is really incredible. When her family moved into the White House, she encouraged her parents to make sure that any child that wrote in to the president received a response. So there was a department that was created, inspired by her, and it started in her father's administration to do just that. So every child that writes in to the president receives a response back. I think that's so powerful, and just thinking of all the thousands upon thousands of lives that have been impacted by that is really incredible. So as you know, Chelsea was scheduled to come speak with us earlier this week, but she of course had to change her plans to attend the funeral of George H.W. Bush, and we are so honored that she made it such a priority to reschedule with us so quickly. Just so grateful that she's made the time to come be with us. So today, we're also very fortunate to have our amazing CMO, Shannon Brayton, to lead the discussion with Chelsea. And I'm just so excited to welcome them both to the stage. So please put your hands together for Chelsea Clinton and Shannon Brayton. Well, as Rochelle said, we are beyond thrilled to have you here. And when we chatted in the green room and I thanked her for rescheduling so quickly, you talked about the importance of keeping your commitments. And I really, really appreciate it. And I know all the employees do too. So thank you so much for being here, especially after such an emotional and busy week for you. 
well, thank you, uh, Tiffany, and thank you to Rochelle for rescheduling so quickly so that I could be here. And I just really want to thank uh, Rochelle and her whole team and everyone who's made this possible in the room and on the live stream. I know events like this um, always require a lot more work than is evident to those of us who just show up at eight o'clock in the morning. Uh, so really just, um, can we give them a round of applause? Since you gave yourselves a round of applause, let's give them a round of applause. Very gracious, thank you very much. So I do firesides quite often, and I have found a device that really works well. It's something called Woman in a Minute, and I'm gonna ask you 20 quick questions to get the audience warmed up, and usually the speaker, not that you water. really need it, but take some water for that, I might too. And I'm gonna just, um, they're all one word answers, so this will be super easy. Okay. I promise. <laughs> and we're gonna start, are you game? My favorite color's blue. I mean, I don't know. Yes, I don't okay. have a favorite color on. Okay. <laughs> TV show you're watching right now? Uh, Peaky Blinders. What was the last show you saw in the theater? That's what you ask a New Yorker, not a Californian. Uh, the last show I saw in the theater uh, was uh, Torch Song. Favorite ice cream flavor? Uh, mint chocolate chip. Instagram or Snapchat? Neither. <laughs> band you can listen to at any time? Uh, does it have to be a band? No. Uh, Sam Cooke. If you had more time, what would you do? Spend more time with my kids. If you had less, if you could choose anything you could do less of, what would it be? Be on an airplane. It's a good one. Least favorite word? Uh, anything that's cruel. Least favorite sound? Uh, a child crying. Favorite day of the week? Uh, goodness gracious, favorite day of the week. Um, Sunday, I guess. This one should be easy. Your favorite president? <laughs> My dad. I'm not gonna ask you your least favorite president. <laughs> Netflix or Amazon? Oh, I, that I, I, I don't wanna choose. Like, I just confessed I was watching Peaky Blinders and I'm really excited about The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, so both. Best show ever, love Mrs. Maisel. Introvert or extrovert? Extrovert. Favorite holiday? Christmas. Okay. So thank you very much. That's oh, wow. Thank you. Very impressive. Okay, so we learned a little bit about you, but you've literally been in the public eye your entire life. What is one thing you wish people really knew about you that they don't? I mean, I, I, I don't know the answer to that because I imagine there are as many questions as there are people in this room today or uh, watching on live stream. Um, you know, I think what I would hope would be evident but may not be is while I am fiercely proud to be my parents' daughter um, and incredibly grateful for all the work they have done and continue to do in the world, by far and away the most important identity now in my life is being my kid's mom. And I, and I wish that people really understood that about me, that I can both be really proud of my parents and, and proud to be their daughter, and also so fundamentally be foremost, kind of first and last uh, committed to my kids now. As What's their the mom. best part about being a mom? Oh my gosh, I love being a mom. I have two kids, um, Charlotte and Aiden, they're four and two, and they just bring me endless joy. And I'm so grateful to be uh, to be their mom at every moment, even in the middle of the night, because sometimes that's when I get the best cuddles. So Rochelle mentioned a lot about Start Now in terms of it talking about activism and getting kids thinking about how they can help their global communities really early. And I love that concept. And I was wondering, I couldn't help but wonder what the dinner table conversations in your house were like, given you have two parents committed so much to activism and service. What were those conversations like when you were a young kid? Well, I really am thankful to my parents, particularly now that I am a parent, that they always expected to m me to be informed about the world around me and, and to have an opinion and also to be able to um, make an argument kind of in line with that opinion and to know the difference between um, kind of facts and not facts and trying to muster an argument even from an early age. Um, and the first thing I learned to read was the newspaper um, because when I- you were how old? I think I started reading the newspaper when I was about four and a half. Um, and to be, Overachiever. to be able to like have um, access to information firsthand and not have to rely on my parents or my teachers 
or my grandparents to filter that for me and start to try to have an opinion. And admittedly, like most of what I had an opinion about when I was uh, young was school, because like that was the majority of my life was what I thought we should be kind of learning more of or what I wasn't as interested in or what I wanted to have for lunch or like what I thought we should be able to do during recess and like how frustrated I was sometimes that we didn't get to do what I wanted to do during recess. I mean, these may sound small, but my parents always took my concerns really seriously. So like, of course, like you are part of your school community. Like you should have a voice in this as a student. And I'm so thankful for that because they always valued my opinion and treated me as a person in my own right you know, even when I was like five or seven or nine. And now, even though my children are, are younger than that, my daughter is learning um, how to read and she's fascinated by the oceans, like they're her number one area of interest. She's obsessed with whales and sharks and fish and jellyfish and coral. And then that gives us a chance to talk about climate change and how like we recycle at home and how that is related then to helping protect the health of the oceans. And I like to think I would do that without the example of my parents, but I don't know. And I'm really grateful to the example of my parents. So I know how important that is to engage her early so that hopefully she'll stay engaged and motivated throughout her life. Do you feel like four is a great time to start that conversation with the child and really get it ingrained in their brains? Well, because she's so curious. Um, and you know, we're really lucky we live in New York City where we have the chance to go to the Museum of Natural History like weekly if possible so she can learn about some other aspect of the ocean. And um, I'm gonna give a shameless plug uh, for other parents in the room, National Geographic Kids really is an amazing resource. And she gets so excited when it arrives every month and we read it Any fans together. Any fan Geo Kids in the room? Good, so, you know, that's a I, I, you know, think it's the right age for her because her curiosity is driving her. She's also in school and she's starting to, you know, deal with something that is sadly, I think, present in every kid's life, uh, which is bullying. And some kids who are not particularly nice, and particularly some kids who are already starting to be not particularly nice to girls and are starting to say, you know, girls can't do this. You know, this is not the place for girls. Girls don't belong. I mean, she's four and she's already hearing things like that. And I think, you know, that has to be a moment to engage and say, that's not true. Don't listen to those voices. Like you belong in any space that you kind of want to be part of and that you feel safe in. And so I just think, you know, four or five really are the ages where partly because of what's happening in their lives in, in preschool or kindergarten and also kind of what kids are already saying they're interested in, that there are really profound opportunities for parents, grandparents, other caregivers to help to start engage kids as citizens. You do talk about bullying in the book, and I was going to ask you a little bit about it because I have followed you on Twitter for a long time, and I think the way you respond to the people who speak unkindly on Twitter about you or your parents is really admirable. And so I'm curious if you would talk a little bit about your journey to make that decision to take the high road with some of these trolls on Twitter. Well, I used to ignore bullying um, like in, in real life and online. Uh, everything that people say to me on Twitter, they've said to me in real life. I mean, people have come up to me and said, you know, you're ugly, or like, looking at you makes me sick, or you're the seed of the devil, or I wish your parents had aborted you, or like, why don't you like just go into a hole, or I mean, like any type of vileness you can probably imagine like someone has said to me to my face. So kind of for all of the, I think, general thinking that um, segregates what happens online and offline, like that has not been my experience. While it may be more common kind of online, it is not disconnected to what people then feel somehow righteous in saying to me in real life. Uh, but I used to ignore it. I mean, people used to say things like that to me and I would say like, I'm so sorry you feel that way. And I meant it because I would always think like, what happened to you? Like, what went wrong for you? Like, what broke in you that you ever thought it was okay to come up to someone you don't know? Like, you may think you know me, but you don't know me, and say something so hateful. Like, I'm so sorry that you feel this way. And that is still true. Like, I still feel so deeply sad that clearly something either didn't happen or something horrific happened kind of in, in people's lives who say things like that. 
But I came to think that ignoring it somehow could be treated as um, permissive or, or complacent or complicit. And that that left a vacuum and that only more darkness would fill that vacuum. And I think there's a lot of darkness in the world right now. And I think we have to stand up against it and shine a light on it wherever possible and not and not allow, though, it to degrade our own humanity. Like, I refuse to let someone else's vileness, you know, make me less. Um, but I also no longer think it's healthy or helpful to ignore it. So I don't have time um, to respond to all of it, um, and that may not be a healthy strategy either. I do think, though, it is important to um, elevate uh, some of it to shine a light and say, you know, this is never okay. Also because I've come to realize that the things that people, and they're generally men, they're not always men, but they're generally men, are saying to me, they're also saying to other women in their lives. And so I've decided it's important to shine a light and to say, you know, this is not okay, but with kind of fierce kindness, um, not only for myself, but also for women everywhere who may be experiencing, some, experiencing something similar you know, online or in their daily lives. We talk a lot about compassionate leadership at LinkedIn. That's one of the tenets we really hold up. And what you just described is really the core of being compassionate. How did you decide that that's what you were going to do in the face of all of that? I, mean, I, don't, I don't think I ever, I mean, I never reached a decision about kind of feeling sorrow um, that people kind of had such meanness harbored in their hearts or their spirits because of something that had happened to them. That's just the way I've always felt. I mean, people have been saying, you know, cruel things to me for as long as I can remember. And um, in 1986, um, so, so to back up, my dad uh, was governor when I was born. So 1980, I, I was born, my father I was governor, and he... Um, he lost that year. And so uh, we moved out of the governor's mansion in 1982. Arkansas, it's a fun bit of trivia for you. It could come up in Trivial Pursuit. You can think of me now forever, kind of hereafter. Um, Arkansas was the last state in the country to move to four-year gubernatorial election. So it used to be two years. So 1982, he, um, he wins. Uh, he wins in 1984, in 1986, he's uh, up for re-election, but they're moving to four-year terms. And he's running against um, a man named Frank White, who um, was like, a pretty unapologetic segregationist. Uh, and as much as he had deep animus kind of towards my dad, he had even more toward my mom. Like, who is she to think that she can work and be the First Lady of Arkansas? Like, obviously, she doesn't really care about being the First Lady of Arkansas. If she took her role seriously, like, she wouldn't still work as a lawyer. And, you know, since she does effectively have two jobs, like, oh, poor Chelsea, she must be really neglected. Like, she's probably really suffering because her parents probably never see her. And I remember, like, listening to all this and being like, that's crazy. Like, I see my parents for dinner every night. Like, I don't know who you think you are or what you're talking about. Um, but the effort was not only to kind of minimize my mother and kind of good old fashioned misogyny, but also to like strip agency away from me, even as a kid, to say like, I didn't really understand like what was happening around me. And I'm somewhat grateful for that experience because I realized that none of that was true. Like it wasn't true in my like lived experience, it wasn't objectively true. And then when my dad ran for president, um, in 1992, I, I slipped and fell in ballet class and I fractured my foot and I had to get a cast. And after one of the debates in Michigan, um, I was on the front page of the National Enquirer uh, the following week, is having thrown myself off of the roof of the governor's mansion, like looking for attention. Because <laughs> again, I'd been like so horrifically, like horrifically abandoned by my parents. And like, oh, poor Chelsea, like, look at how far she's being pushed to like, gain some time from her parents. And I remember thinking too, like, but I fell in ballet class. Like, I, I know that happened. 
like my ballet teacher knows that happened. Like all my ba- friends from ballet knows that happened. Like my parents, I had to call my parents from the emergency room because I needed like their permission for the doctor to treat me. Like my ballet teacher couldn't like give them that permission. Um, and I'm so thankful in some ways that those were some of my first brushes kind of with negativity and kind of an effort to infantilize me even as a kid and to kind of take away my personhood, even as a kid, because it just then was so evident, like none of that was real, right? None of it. Um, And all of it was from a place that I didn't want to dwell. But I think that's part of what then led me to just ignoring it, which is now no longer the strategy, although I think probably was the right strategy, particularly when I was a kid. How do you talk to your kids about compassion? And how do you build that? There's lots of parents in the audience, too. How do you start that conversation with children, with Charlotte and Aiden? Well, my son is two, and while I try to have kind of more serious conversations with him, they don't last very long. Um, But with my daughter, you know, we talk a lot about, I say the two most important things in life are to be brave and to be kind. And I really believe that. Of course I want her to be curious and hardworking and smart and everything else that I think all of us want for our kids. But I fundamentally believe that if she is brave and if she is kind, she will be a good person. And that's what I want most for her and what I want most for her in the world. I also think she'll be able to protect herself against some of the things I know inevitably, sadly, will come her way because she is my daughter. So it's both what I want kind of for her is just like any little person in the world and also what I want her um, to be equipped with kind of in her marrow and in her blood to her core as my daughter. So speaking of little kids, what types of reactions have you had from young children who've read the book? What have they said to you about what they've taken away from it? So I started my tour um, at the beginning of October, but what's been so great kind of over time is I now meet kids who've already read my book. And they tell me about, you know, I've had, Truly, I lost count. I lost count at like, you know, 20 kids who've told me they are petitioning or they successfully convinced their schools to have a buddy bench. Or like I've had three kids who've already told me they've convinced their schools to start community garden programs and to partner with local soup kitchens. And these are all elementary school age kids. And so that I just find so um, fulfilling You know, I wrote this hoping that it would impact like one kid's life and the fact that it's already impacted so many kids' lives and given them not only permission and expectation but real tools to try to make a difference uh, is everything I'd hoped for. And you've written five books. So your book, She Persisted, I have a hunch about where the title came from, but I'd love for you to tell the audience a little about how you came up with the idea for the book, obviously the title, and who your favorite character from that book is. Uh, Well, um, I'm sure all of you watch C-SPAN late at night like I do sometimes. Um, And I was watching C-SPAN late at night. uh, Well, it would have been earlier here, I guess, but it was fairly late in New York. You know, last January, watching uh, the confirmation hearing of then Senator Jeff Sessions um, to be our next Attorney General. And as I'm sure many of you know, Senator Elizabeth Warren I was attempting to read a letter that Coretta Scott King had written in 1986, at the time concerning um, Jeff Sessions' nomination to the federal bench. And uh, it was a letter that she wrote to the Reagan administration, like pain, it was quite a long letter, like painfully outlining his like, clear history of racism. And Senator Warren believed that if uh, he had been deemed too racist in 1986 to be a federal judge, which the Reagan administration had determined they withdrew his nomination after Mrs. King's letter. Like, surely he should be considered too racist to be our attorney general in 2017. Um, And I think it's always the right time to hear from Mrs. King. I think she's too often treated in our history books as like only Dr. King's widow, Uh, but she was a hugely significant, important civil rights leader in her own right, and I think deserves to be kind of named and treated in history as such. And so kind of Senator Warren, I think, really believed like surely everyone's going to want to hear what Mrs. King had written. But unfortunately, that was not true among her Republican uh, senator colleagues in the majority. And Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell 
you know, asked her to be quiet, asked her to be quiet, and the third time formally censured her, like effectively removed her right to speak on the Senate floor. She immediately left and like read the letter out loud to like the world's media and on Facebook Live, um, but it clearly wasn't the same because it wouldn't be entered into the Senate record. And later that same night, um, kind of reflecting on the incident, you know, Mitch McConnell like cast himself as the victim, which was I thought a rather extraordinary sleight of hand. Ugh, oh, like he kept telling her to be quiet again, like one of these annoying women who just won't be quiet. They kept telling her to be quiet. She wouldn't be quiet. You know, she was warned. Nevertheless, she persisted. And I don't think um, Senator McConnell had any idea how many women, and to be fair, some men would really take this as a rallying cry. And I was thinking about like how I would explain this to my daughter, um, because she had she'd been sort of aware of the election, um, and kind of sort of aware of what was happening not only around her grandmother but around I think women more broadly. So I was thinking, like, how do I try to explain this to her? And then I was thinking about how many American women in different walks of life have inspired me, not only through what they've done, but really through their persistence. And then I started talking to my like, wonderful editor at Penguin, Jill Santopolo, and she was like also up late at night watching C-SPAN, so clearly we get along very well. And she was like, I just think like we should do something. Should I agree? And she said, let's try to write a picture book and I immediately like, had even more ideas about women who inspired me. And I knew also pretty immediately who I wanted to illustrate it because uh, my daughter loved the Tulula Ballerina series, which Alexandra Boyer had illustrated. And I thought it was kind of the perfect combination of like, earnestness and also accessibility. And thankfully, Alexandra uh, was free and interested. And so we started working together. Um, and the 13 women that I include in the book um, are all really meaningful to me. Like I remember um, both my mom and my grandmother talking to me a lot about how much they looked up to Helen Keller. And I remember my mom talking to me about Harriet Tubman and always saying like one of her greatest achievements as first lady was that she raised enough money um, to preserve into perpetuity Harriet Tubman's home where she passed away and to turn it into a national monument, which it is. You can go visit it in Maryland today. Um, another trivial pursuit question. Yeah, all right. So now we have to find a third so there can be a trifecta. Um, and like I remember learning about you know, Nellie Bly and Clara Limlick in school, and I remember watching Flojo break the record in the Seoul Olympics, and I remember watching old videos of Maria Tallchief and you know, knowing I would never remotely be as talented as she was, but being so inspired by her dancing. And I remember my mom talking about Margaret Chase Smith as one of her real inspirations to later run for office. And I worshiped Sally Ride as a kid, and she was my space camp graduation speaker, you know, 25 years ago. Um, and so all of the women in the book, like, very much I felt a personal connection to. And so I don't think I could choose a favorite. It was important to me also to include um, kind of the three women who were at kind of the point of origin for the story for me. Um, my mom, uh, Credit Scott King, and Senator Warren. But I didn't want kind of the moment to overshadow the powerful stories of the other 13 women. So I dedicated the book to Senator Warren, and then I kind of put a portrait, well, really Alexandra, at my request, put a portrait, because I have no artistic ability, put a portrait of my mom in the opening gallery scene, and then there's a beautiful bust that is in the foreground. It's kind of the, the most prominent part of the opening gallery scene of, of Mrs. King. And Senator Warren, I imagine, is very touched by the book. She's been, uh, she's been very generous about the book. Okay. I know this is a bit, we have a smorgasbord to choose from here. If you had to tell the audience what you think the biggest issue facing the nation right now is, what do you think it is? Well, I, I would hope that everyone in some ways has their own answer to that because we need a lot of help on everything. Um, you know, an issue uh, that I've been very outspoken about and one that I hadn't known I would be outspoken about at the beginning of the year because it just never occurred to me that um, our government would do this has been the family separations at the border, which are continuing. Um, and I am horrified that our government is engaged in such fundamental cruelty. And I also, even I am surprised um, that this has not 
kind of catalyzed a more kind of bipartisan response because it is so fundamentally cruel and it is against kind of the, I would argue, ethics of at least what I like to believe the United States is at our best, although too often over history we have failed to live up to that premise and it's certainly also against um, kind of the morality of all of the major faith traditions that uh, people in Congress profess to be part of. So I really struggle with the fact that we have, we don't even really know, but probably 14,000 kids in detention right now along the border, that these are largely black sites. We have no visibility into what's happening in these sites. Like, God bless Rice as Texas and the other organizations that are desperately trying to shine a light on what is happening uh, with the family. Uh, separation um, policies and practices and the real effects that this is having on on children uh, today and the anticipated effects that it will have on those children for the rest of their lives. And so I think there is so much that I find um, kind of outrageous, right? I'm horrified that, you know, we have a, about a dozen years to try to radically change how we produce and use energy. Otherwise, we are careening toward catastrophic climate change that will affect our lives and certainly affect our children and our grandchildren's lives. And we have a government that is opening the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge to drilling, like taking us out of the Paris Climate Accord, like ruling back President Obama's uh, various uh, climate change rules stripping the EPA effectively of its scientists. You know, I think that's also a really big issue. Um, I think it should trouble all of us that Affordable Care Act um, kind of signups have plummeted because the administration has not funded outreach efforts and marketing and advertising efforts that are funded in the bill. So it's not as if like they needed to go find money to do this, they're just not drawing on the money that's already there. You know, which clearly is troubling because we know health insurance correlates to better health outcomes. That shouldn't be surprising, but I think it often is to people. You know, I'm like totally um, troubled that conversion therapy is still legal in most of the country, um, which is child abuse, and that shouldn't be a dispute. So, like, I think there is so much to be outraged by right now. I also think there's so much to feel good about because we do have a lot happening at various local and state efforts to protect children, to try to expand Medicaid, to try to fill the gaps that the administration's leaving in the Affordable Care Act, you know, to try to both ameliorate some of what I think is the bad coming out of you know, the federal government and to try to also help really good things happen. Um, so for me, um, there are the things I'm outraged by um, and that I feel really strongly in standing in opposition to. And then there are also the things that I think it's really important to affirm and support and promote and help protect and amplify. So I think um, I would hope for all of us that we can you know, live in those spaces simultaneously. Like what we think it's really important to stand against and also what we think it's equally important like to stand for and to, and to work for. And tying the idea of activism in Start Now with a group of employees who tend to be very activism oriented, what tactical recommendations would you tell all of us to take away today as we think about all of these issues and how we can contribute to helping tackle them? I think it really depends on what everybody in this room individually cares about. Um, and I say that because I think there are, of course, things we can do in our own lives um, you know, like 40% of the energy leakage in our country is from buildings, right? So ensuring that the buildings where we like live and work and play and spend time are as energy efficient is I think something we all can do in our own lives um, while also still trying to push um, whomever's in elected office to have a kind of science first um, predicate for then making decisions about fighting climate change and trying to help our earth be sustainable long into the future. You know, but I think, you know, there are some issues that are, you know, much more determined at the local and the state level. And I think that's important to recognize too, because there's a lot of attention paid to Washington for understandable reasons, particularly now, but a lot happens at the local and state level. So one of the issues I spend a lot of time kind of talking about is criminal justice reform. Um, 88, 89% of the people incarcerated in our country are sitting in like local jails and state prisons. 
So who's in Washington matters. Like I really hope that Congress can see its way toward doing what it can do, like banning the box so that employers can't ask about previous uh, criminal history and things that the federal government can do. But if that's an issue you really care about, like put that on the agenda of your state legislatures here in California, particularly here in California. Like know who your local district attorney is because district, district attorneys have enormous discretion in kind of what they charge people with and the sentencing they ask for. So if criminal justice is something you really care about, trying to help reform and make more equitable, you know, really focus your energies on where you can make a difference, and a lot of it's at local and state level. So I just think, Tiffany, the answer to your question varies kind of issue by issue, and I think we're all more likely to sustain our engagement if we're engaging with issues that we're really passionate about, whether we start from a place of anger or hope or both. And what I hear out of that, too, is don't lose momentum and don't lose hope and continue to fight. Never. I mean, like, the number of people who say to me, like, oh, like, after the 2016 election, like, if I were you, I just would have, like, pulled the covers over my head and cried for six months. <laughs> I'm like, what good does that do anybody? Right? Like, I have two kids. Like, I want them to live in a world that is, like, a heck of a lot healthier and more equitable and just and sustainable, happier, um, than it is today. Like, how could I look them in the eye if I like pulled the covers over my head and like cried for six months? And oh, by the way, they would just eat frozen waffles because that's what happens when I'm not around. My husband just like seems to feed them frozen waffles. So like that also just would not work on like a basic family level. So shifting gears slightly, you've lived all over the country, Arkansas, DC, New York now, and obviously spent time in California when you were going to Stanford. What do you think the rest of the country's view of Silicon Valley actually is? Well, I never speak for anybody else. So it's What not, do you think? Yeah, so I mean that quite seriously. Like I don't even speak for my parents or my kids. Like sometimes people are like, what do you think your mom would say about this? I'm like, I don't ask her. Mm -hmm. I mean that. Like I don't, I don't. I speak only for myself, um, so I would not like speak for someone in this room today or someone living in a different part of the country. Um, I reframe the question. Please. What do you think, Silicon Valley, how is it viewed by the rest of the country? Well, I think that uh, clearly, you know, I, when I was a student at Stanford, so I arrived in the autumn of... 1997. I think I'd gotten an email account like in 1996 when I was a junior in high school. AOL account? Um, I just did an internal school email account, okay. not even AOL account. <laughs> like I, I just, it was like at sidwell.edu, right? It was just, and I think we could only write to other Sidwell students. And I don't think I could access it remotely, which meant like all of my email happened during my like one hour of computer lab, which really meant like 10 minutes because the other 50 minutes were spent like, I don't know, learning basic programming language and like playing strange math games. Um, so, you know, when I arrived in 1997, you know, it, it really was so different than any other place I'd ever been. Um, and the phenomenon of feeling like I was in a bubble was something I felt quite consciously. And in some ways that was incredibly exciting. Like, wow, like so much is being imagined and created, like literally right here at Stanford. And I was like deep into history and bio. So I was not part of that. I just sort of felt like I had a ringside seat to it. But there also were some parts that frustrated me. Like I'll never forget, I was out for a run one day because it was not just like the computer scientists that this, I think, impacted. Um, I was out for a run one day and my chemistry TA was like running in the other direction. And I still remember his name, but I won't say it. And he, he stopped and he turned around and he said, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. He said, are we at war? I said, excuse me? He said, well, I walked by a television today and like we're bombing somewhere or something. I said, we've been bombing Slobodan Milosevic for 72 days to stop the genocide of the Kosovar Albanians. He's like, what are the Kosovar Albanians? I was like, oh my gosh. It's like, well, you know, it is like, it's like trying to draw a map, like, you know, on the side of the dish. I was like, so here's like, no, I'd stopped running at this point. I was like trying to explain like where the Balkans were and like why this was important. He had no idea what I was talking about. 
okay, like maybe I didn't need him to know like where the Balkans were, but the fact that somehow he'd gone 72 days without realizing that like the American led NATO forces were trying to stop a genocide was just so illustrative to me of so much of what also frustrated me about my time at Stanford. So while I found it incredibly exciting to have this ringside seat and understood probably there had to be some like disconnect from the world as it was then to help create the world of the future, sometimes the depth and breadth of the disconnect I found really challenging. Um, and I think that's still true today. I would agree with you. And so how though that gets reconciled, probably all of you in this room today um, have a better sense and sensibility than I do, but I think particularly now it's important to reconcile. And I relate to the frustration in that so many companies which are very well funded are figuring out how to do things like get people their food faster as opposed to, and no offense to any company that delivers food, obviously, but there are so many issues that we just listed off that Silicon Valley resources potentially could be better used for. And I think that's where that bubble and that frustration can sometimes come from and that reputation, which isn't always pristine. Okay, so it is 940 and I promised we would leave 20 minutes for questions. So while people gather to some microphones, either in San Francisco or around the world, I wanted to ask you if there was one thing you wanted us to take away from Start Now and just the concept of activism, what should it be? To engage the young people in your life. I mean, I know this is a book written really for like six to 10 year olds, but I hope it also can be a resource as a kind of dialogue starter between kids and the adults in their lives, whether it's older siblings or aunts, uncles, you know, parents, godparents, uh, because I know how much it meant to me to feel inspired and empowered as a kid and to feel like I had value as a kid not only like as a child, but as a citizen and as an activist. Um, and I don't think your last name should be Clinton for that to be true. And I believe that so strongly because of the stories I share in the book and also because of now the stories I've heard in the last couple of months of like other kids who are already really inspired to start making a positive difference. And we know that's not only good for those kids today, it's also good kind of for their lives going forward uh, because we have just reams of evidence that kind of the earlier kids engage, the more likely they are to stay engaged throughout their lives. And that's just good, I think, for all of us. Absolutely. So it looks like Rochelle has a question. I just, I have a quick note on asking questions if you're not in this room um, and you're at LinkedIn, you can go to go slash speaker series and there's a link there where you submit your questions. I just wanted to clarify that and then I think Chris is up. Thank you. Chris. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, thank you for coming. Um, just a quick thank you to everything you do. Uh, I was in advance for the Obamas and uh, your mom in the last campaign, and I did it definitely because of what you guys devote to the world, so thank you so much. Um, but a question from the stream is from Linda. What advice would you give your younger self? Be less afraid. <laughs> Hi, Chelsea. Thank you uh, so much for your honesty today and what you've shared. I think you can just look around the room before I get to my question and see that a lot of us are very inspired um, by how honest you've been. Um, so my name's Jack, and my question for you is a little bit personal. Um, I'm curious if there's a, a belief that you carry that if you changed it or lifted it, it might lead to you experiencing your reality in just a dramatically different way. Oh, I'm sure, right? If I, you know, I'm asked sometimes if I'm a feminist and I say, yes, of course, because I believe that women and men should fundamentally have equal rights and equal opportunities, right? If I wasn't a feminist, like, I think I would have a different husband and a very different life today. Um, so I, I don't know if that's what you meant, but I think about that a lot because um, my kind of greatest pleasure outside of like obviously being with my family so really after my kids uh, go to sleep and particularly my husband and I the shows that we watch we watch together and like this is like a really important part of our like faithfulness is like we don't cheat on like watching like <laughs> Peaky Blinders without the other or The Voice which is like our real guilty pleasure and we're really far behind in The Voice so I also have to like I periodically unfollow them on Twitter so that I don't like see what's happened if we haven't like watched the episodes. 
Um, and yeah, like if my husband's away or asleep, you know, I love reading um, detective novels with female protagonists. And I think a lot about, and almost all of them are not set, they're certainly not set in the 21st century, and many of them are kind of set, you know, in the 18th, 19th, or early 20th century. And, and I just think about, like, how hard all of these fictional women's lives were to follow the careers that they felt called to and how often they have to, like, sublimate themselves to less qualified men to help them, like, get the piece of evidence they need. Um, and how different their lives would have been, too. I feel very attached to people like Maisie Dobbs. Like, how different their lives would have been, too, if they had not kind of fundamentally believed in feminism before it even had a word to name it. So I think there are lots of things that would be different in my life if I didn't kind of fundamentally believe in science. I wouldn't have like vaccinated my children. I also spent a lot of time trying to beat back the anti-vaxxers online. Um, and like I wouldn't be worried about climate change, right? So maybe if I didn't believe in science, that would be equally disruptive to my life. Um, but I think about how important it is to my life that I'm a feminist, not only in kind of how I spend my time and where I spend my time, but also now particularly as a mother to a daughter and a son and as a wife. Hi there, my name is Kendall Ash. I'm from Washington, DC. I just wanted to say go fighting Quakers. I also went to Sidwell. <laughs> um, fighting Quakers, like so the my greatest question. contradiction of all time. I know. <laughs> it's an oxymoron. We liked it. We're nerds. It's fine. Um, so my question, I'm just going to read it real quick. Um, how does the fact that you grew up as a child as a political figure in a time without modern social media um, like shape the way that you view politics today as it, as it is he heavily influenced by social media? That's a great question and not one I've really thought about before. Um, I do think there is this sense today, particularly for people who you know, have really engaged uh, only recently, either because of um, like really being inspired by President Obama and his campaign, or inspired uh, by my mom, or horrified by President Trump. I think there is the sense that like this viciousness is new and somehow a product of social media, um, and that is not true at all, right? I mean, if we look at like the early newspapers of the Republic, like the things that people were saying about George Washington or John Adams were just as vicious as the things that they're saying. And your ballet story, right? About, yeah, or like, yeah, or even my own experience growing up. So, you know, while they're, because they were all white men, there weren't the same like racist and sexist often overt um, dynamics to the criticism against the Obamas or my mom, um, it was still very nasty. And so I think that's important to have just as a kind of piece of context. And certainly, you know, when I was growing up, um, it may not have had the same kind of virality that things have today. And we've never had a national figure who lies so brazenly and kind of has a medium to do that through Twitter that the president does. So I will say that is very different um, than in kind of previous administrations or previous periods in American history. But sadly, like the nastiness has always been there. Um, I think what is different today really is the, um, the lying and the gaslighting, right? I mean, even yesterday, right, President Trump saying like fake news about the news media, um, and we've never had such a relentless attack on the First Amendment by a major political figure. We've never had such a relentless attack on science either. I mean, I was um, you know, so honored to be at President uh, Bush's funeral a couple of days ago in Washington, and then I was reflecting afterwards like, you know, he's the reason that we had a worldwide covenant against acid rain, right? He spoke like 25 years ago about today what we would call a carbon tax. It, that was not the terminology then, but he spoke about maybe needing to have some sort of tax against pollution. 
right? He spoke about endangered species and the need to have like collective action to really help protect endangered species here in the United States and around the world. And I don't think it would have ever occurred to him to traffic in like anti-vax insanity, right? So I think that's the main difference that social media has really enabled is not only kind of the president to you know, say things that are so fundamentally untrue and I also think offensive to our American values, but also then to those kind of then being spread and amplified um, by his core supporters who equally like don't respect the First Amendment, equally have no respect for science or then the kind of conclusions that should come from actually listening to and responding to kind of what the scientific evidence says, either on a personal level or on a collect like collective action level. So that I think is the bigger difference. Sheena. Yes. Thank you, Chelsea, for being here. I'm like fangirling right now. <laughs> Um, I wanted to ask, um, so I have kids as well who are three and five, and um, my mom was a stay-at-home mom, as you talked about. Your mom was um, a lawyer, and you got to see firsthand about how she was juggling. Um, I wanted to know, what are your tips as Chelsea on how you balance being a mom and then also, you know, being an activist and an author and being on tour now, but how you balance that so that you can make a difference in this world, but at the same time not feel so guilty, which I think a lot of people, a lot of moms do feel. I'm highly scheduled. Um, my husband and I also work really hard so that one of us is always home. Like there's been less than a handful of nights where one of us hasn't been home in my daughter's four plus years of life. That means though that sometimes like we don't see each other as much. Like he left you know, very early Monday morning. He got back, you know, at like one or two a.m. Like late Tuesday night or early Wednesday morning. I woke up at four thirty Wednesday morning to like catch the six a.m. shuttle um, to D.C. Like I get back late tonight, he has to leave early tomorrow morning. But at least our kids know, like one parent is always there to put them to bed. And so that's really what we solve around and we admittedly schedule as far in advance as possible to ensure, and we, and the fact that he has to travel tomorrow is rare. Like we try really hard to be home on the weekends. And during the weeks we solve for one of us being home with the kids. And while of course I wish that would always be me, that's just not possible because of the other work that I feel drawn to do in the world. Um, and I'm just really thankful that I have a partner who's equally committed to being a present parent. And I also have to say like I, like once I was asked about the invention, I was the most grateful for. And I said like before I had kids, and I know you're gonna laugh, but I actually mean this so deeply. Before I had kids, I would have said contacts and tampons. But truly, like, I do a lot of work, I love to run, like I need both those things, <laughs> right? But now, I would say unquestionably, like I'm still grateful to those things, but unquestionably it's FaceTime. Like without a question. The fact that even, like I woke up this morning at five o'clock in the morning so that I could FaceTime with my kids before, like my daughter went to school this morning, right? And I will, like call her and my son, they'll be in different places, but I'll call them both before I get on the plane today. Because by the time I land in New York, like they're gonna be asleep. So like highly scheduled, thankful to have a partner who's equally committed to being a present parent. We solve for that and thank you FaceTime. I remember your mom actually talking quite a bit about how the kids would call her on FaceTime during the campaign. It is a, it's an excellent Any adventure. of you know the engineers who worked on that product, like please thank them for me. Like truly from the bottom of my heart. And a reminder, no Peaky Blinders this weekend. Yeah, no, don't worry, don't worry. You promised. Hi Chelsea, thanks for sharing so genuinely. I'm Angela and I admire your Masters of Public Health from Columbia. Um, my question is around one of the biggest public health crises our nation faced today, which is gun violence. And I'm wondering how you can encourage us to create common sense dialogue around it and how to be agents of change, specifically in ending the gun violence epidemic. Well, 
I will say, um, you know, as as someone who like lived through the debate around the assault weapons ban um, in the 1990s and um, all of the evidence that we know that it like directly correlated to a decline in deaths, not only in mass shootings, but also um, in domestic violence um, related shootings. You know, we know that uh, smart, sensible gun violence prevention regulations work. And yet, because of something called the Dickey Amendment, the Centers for Disease Control is not able to do like the same level of rigorous research, or really any level of rigorous research that it does on other public health crises like the opioid epidemic or the fact that we now have like an explosion of HIV in particularly bisexual men of color in our country. The CDC can respond to those like relatively new health crises over the last few years and put enormous re research efforts into understanding like what the antecedents are, like where the greatest risk is, and also like what interventions are most likely to make a difference. It does not have the ability to do that in gun violence. Thankfully, particularly in the last couple of years, like other researchers are really stepping into the breach. So Columbia, where I teach, has invested a lot of money into this area, like plenty of other um, institutions. Johns Hopkins, which I think is where Rochelle went, also has invested a lot of money into this area. Um, and so we are starting to really see, given like the different things that have happened at the state level, we now have a pretty robust and growing evidence case like for what really makes a difference. And a lot of it is not surprising, but at least now we have an evidence base. Um, the NRA is arguably the most successful civil rights organization in America's history. Right? They're certainly the most well-funded. Um, thankfully, they had a drop in funding this year, but they still raised tens of millions of dollars. And we know they're so powerful because the vast majority of Americans don't even need the evidence base to believe in things like an assault weapons ban, like requiring either all households or households with children to keep guns and ammunition locked up and stored separately, right? Having child safety locks, closing you know, the private um, gun show and private sale loopholes, like mandating in all instances, you know, a waiting period to complete comprehensive background checks. Like all of these things have, depending on which one we're talking about, like upwards of 85% of American support. But the NRA is really powerful, which is why we now see so much energy and effort dedicated to the state level and to what can states really do on their own to push forward, while also still now trying to revitalize, particularly with the new Congress coming in in January, the assault weapons ban. Because even though President Trump will never sign it, if the House can pass it and continue to keep passing it, hopefully when there is another administration, it can easily kind of be moved forward. So I think, you know, until we have a new administration, continue to push for what we can like in the House is really important. And also, like, don't lose momentum in a lot of what's happening at the state level because we have had very real wins from Maryland to California at the state level in the last few years, and we need to keep advancing those. Yeah, thank you. I think we have time for just one more question. Hi, Chelsea, my name's Amy. Um, I loved hearing the story about how you came up with the book title of She Persisted. Um, hearing you speak, I'm fairly confident the books will be written about you at some point, and I wondered if a book was to be written about you, what would you want the title to be? Goodness, uh, you know, sometimes I'm asked like if, if someone could say one thing after I died, I could ask that question with odd frequency. I, <laughs> I really hope that I'm gonna live. I mean, I'd like to see 100, like, you know, I don't know. I take pretty good care of myself. Um, and I always say like, she was the best mom that Charlotte and Aiden could have asked for. Right, because I do believe that that is first and foremost. And a wonderful daughter. And, well, and a wonderful daughter and a good wife and a good friend. I hope all of that is true. But if I could only pick one thing, right, I'd want to be the best mom. If a book was written about me, goodness, you know, I think there's just so much more to do in life. But clearly I care about persistence, so maybe she just never gave up. 
you'd be I a think very we'd interesting that book. subject for a really great book. So we all look forward to reading it one day. We can't thank you enough for making us a stop on your tour, especially given what we talked about earlier. Very busy week for you. Very appreciative to you and your team. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, much. Tiffany. Thank you all. Thank you very much.